You're listening to LCC Alumni Stories, a show dedicated to highlighting the amazing alumni of Lansing Community College. I'm Steve Robinson, president of LCC, and on each episode, I have the awesome privilege of getting to know one of our many inspiring alums and hearing about their experiences at and since leaving LCC. The LCC alumni community is expansive and far-reaching. They're an incredibly diverse group of people, representative of all walks of life, working in hundreds of industries across the country. LCC Alumni Stories shines a bright light on alumni who make a positive contribution to their community and showcases those who have overcome obstacles and barriers to achieve academic and personal success. These are their dynamic stories. My guest today is Patricia Spitzley. She earned her associate degree in chemistry at LCC and currently works at Racer Trust as the Deputy Redevelopment Manager and Director of Government Affairs. She's also a member of our Lansing City Council, where she serves on six boards and commissions. Patricia, it's great to talk to you. I'm tired. You're tired? <laughs> I, you know, I hear that. Nowadays, people are tired, aren't they? Yeah, you know, people think, you know, we're at home because of COVID. And right. It's, it's just a horrible thing, but... I think a lot of people are working more at home because of kids and, and jobs, and now you're working at home, so it's just as easy to pick up your laptop on a Saturday. So it's it, it's a lot. It's a lot for people. It is a lot, and it's fun. You came right out of the gate saying what a lot of people are thinking. I'm tired. Yeah. It's and I agree with you. You know, I hear that from our LCC team members. We hear it from students, and there's just a lot going on in the yeah. world right now. And and uh, I'm glad you acknowledge that. Uh, it, People are tired. Yeah. So, but I'm excited to learn about you and your experiences and your journey for where you are today. You're an LCC alum. You studied chemistry. Tell me about that. How did you How did you get excited in chemistry and come into LCC? Uh, well, I've always been a geek and a, and a wonk, and I've loved the sciences. Okay. Um, for, for me, LCC was just a natural extension of, of leaving high school. Okay. I wasn't ready to go to a four year college. Okay. You know, I was, I was, I was kind of a, I was kind of a geek in, co- in a high school and mm-hmm. I wasn't ready. Um, so LCC was a natural extension, um, coming down here for me, it was the big college. Okay. Um, I majored in chemistry, um, because I do like the sciences, um, you know, had great, great, um, instructors. Um, Dr. Evelyn Green, um, was a chemistry professor back then and, okay. and just loved her and was a great role model for me. Well, it's so cool that you remember and, and named one of your professors by name, Dr. Green, yes. who taught chemistry. Um, and what was it about Dr. Green's class and the kind of uh, instruction that you had here that, that resonated with you? She was an African-American female. Okay. And so for me to see an African-American female Mm -hmm. um, that was a professor, but then in the sciences was was amazingly inspirational for me. I see her um, at some of the church functions here in the city of Lansing to this day. That's great. Um, Now, is she retired or is she still here? She's retired. Okay, great. um, Yeah. So it it was for her to see her was amazingly inspirational. I'm glad to hear you say that. You know, there, at this moment in time, that's something we're working on here at LCC is is, is making sure that we have a diverse faculty because our, our faculty is actually not uh, very diverse and there aren't many um, professors of color in the mm-hmm. sciences. So actually, I want to ask you about that. So as a student, what attracted you to the sciences? You must not have seen a lot of other students of color in your classes when you were taking chemistry. No. Um, And even when I went on to Central, I was one of two in um, the science program. I got a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in chemistry Mm -hmm. up at CMU, and I was one of two. I've always liked the sciences. Mm -hmm. Again, um, biology and and, uh, chemistry, I've always liked them. Chemistry is a little difficult for me. But it was a challenge. And so to achieve the associate's degree here and then go on and get a minor in chemistry um, was was great. But I have always liked the sciences. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I came here and she was my professor, it it kind of validated my um, passion for science and that I could, you know, get a degree in the sciences. There is a lot of literature about how just um, having uh, a professor of color can be a real motivator for students to 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 um, 
to go into a particular field. And you mm -hmm. obviously, you went on, you transferred to Central. Yes. Okay, and studied uh, the sciences there. How do you think your experiences here at LCC prepared you for Central? Well, it prepared me to... Um, for studying, mm -hmm. for writing. Uh -huh. um, I wasn't the greatest writer okay. when I left high school. And so my writing class here at LCC was um, the first few weeks was full of red marks. Okay, <laughs> all right. And so um, I had to um, develop that skill. Um, and so just preparing me for that next level mm -hmm. and for the future, I think LCC was that was a great vehicle. I was a student explorer here. Um, um, I was with Dr. Barry Stearns and um, helped other students come in and was part of that welcoming group. Um, I worked for Dr. Bill Shar okay. um, as a student assistant. I mean, I had the greatest experience here at LCC. I love hearing that. And those those uh, details you just shared are examples of what we would call student engagement, mm -hmm. right, or student leadership. So you were, in in some ways, an ambassador. Tell me mm -hmm. the name of that program that you that, that you, go ahead. I think it was Student Explorers, student but it Explorer. could have been like a student. It, but it was definitely a student ambassador sure. program. So during orientation, mm -hmm. we had kind of a leadership role right. in, in, for new students that were coming in, and I really loved that because that helped me um, get out of my shell. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't always as as, as um, loquacious as I am now. <laughs> That's but, hard to imagine. But but that helped me. That helped me to be a little bit more outgoing. Well, fantastic. And so when you when you, when you get to Mount Pleasant and you're taking those classes, it sounds like some of your the relationships with your professors and also the leadership experiences you had at a stu as a student on our campus really helped you be successful uh, in that bachelor's degree. It just gave me the confidence to keep going. Right. And again, you know the. The basic skills, of course, the writing and all the basic skills you need to go forward. But more importantly, the experience I had here um, gave me the confidence to move on to that next step. I jumped into LCC with all feet, you know, with both feet. I was a cheerleader here. You know, I, I, I did everything to um, make my experience the best it could be. Well, and, and that's really inspirational to me because that's what I've found in my career. The students who really throw themselves in and get involved are the ones who thrive and the ones who succeed when they leave. And our favorite success stories are the things our students do after they, they, they're they here. And you ha, you are doing a lot of interesting things. So you, you do government relations for Racer Trust. Tell me about Racer Trust. Racer Trust is uh, it's an environmental trust. Okay. Um, when General Motors went bankrupt um, in 2009, right. um, they put their assets into the bankruptcy court. Okay. And then when they reorganized as new General Motors, they basically, you know, took back what they wanted to for the new GM, but they left a significant footprint in the bankruptcy court. Okay. And it was um, 89 locations in, in 14 states, millions of square feet of buildings, 7,000 acres of land. Um, and, and so it was a very large portfolio of industrial property, the third largest um, industrial property portfolio in the country at the time. Wow. And so the 14 states and an Indian tribe petitioned the federal government and the bankruptcy court and basically said, you cannot leave us with these distressed property. Oh. Many of them had um, environmental historical issues. Yeah, kind of brownfield type exactly. situation. Exactly. Yeah, I understand. And so the, the Racer Trust was formed. Okay. Um, it was formed using, you know, TARP monies, bailout money, as part of the um, bailout of the auto. Right. And so um, it is, it is a, it is a, it's called a qualified environmental trust. But we have a twofold mission. And the, the first mission is to clean up those um, distressed properties to industrial um, standards, but then to turn around and reposition them to, for sale to bring forth jobs you know, economic growth, um, increased tax base, all of those things in the community to help those communities that have been negatively impacted by the bankruptcy of General Motors. So what a great way for you to use your background in the sciences and chemistry and biology for this really important um, future use of these properties. Now, coming back to Lansing, I see that there are a number of them here, right? It's got to be the, the, the former GM facilities. Are they part of your trust? That's correct. The um, Fisher Body um, 
uh, on Saginaw? On, on, yes, on Saginaw uh -huh. by Sexton High School right. is is was part of the Racer Trust portfolio. They're under contract at this point. Um, the largest footprint of our properties was in the state of Michigan. Uh, that of doesn't course. surprise me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and you know, Lansing's so important in the birth of the audio and auto industry. Um, what an important thing. And so in government relations, I assume that you're doing a lot of advocacy for the trust. You're working with, uh, with lawmakers. And tell me a little bit about that. So my role um, is to um, reach out to those 14 locations. Um, it's actually 89 communities that have property in um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 14 states and 89 locations. Right. And so I work with those communities. We um, at the trust, w you know, we, our mission and our goal is to be a good neighbor. And so, you know, I want to make sure that if there's something going on in the community and it impacts our property, that the local unit of government, whether it's a trust township trustee or a mayor or whatever, they know that they can call me. And, you know, and if there's a problem, I can help them. I also, you know, again, educate our the legislators on the local level, on the state and federal level, um, governors as well, as to what the trust is, what our mission is, mm -hmm. keep them abreast of what's going on. We go to D.C. on a regular basis because there's a lot of funding through a lot of organizations that can help our racer communities. So we're always there um, making sure our racer communities are kept in the forefront so that they can be uniquely positioned to receive additional funding, not just for our racer community, but for their community as a whole. That's fantastic because as we redevelop these spaces that were um, that housed some of the largest industrial operations in the world, we really need to be thinking broadly like that. And, and uh, well, thank you for that great work. That sounds like a very, very impactful work here in our community. I think it's always, you know, it's always a good thing and a blessing in my mind is when you find a job that is really fulfilling. And I think that most of the people who I think that all the people that work for the trust would say that this is fulfilling work. Um, you're, you're helping communities that have some of them that have just been devastated right. when GM closed. Exactly. You know, in the city of Flint, we own one of the largest footprints. We own Buick, Buick City. City yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we're working to clean it up and, and redevelop it. Um, we've had people buy a portion of our property and build the first manufacturing in a decade. And so, you know, when you see that, it's incredibly fulfilling. It's huge. I mean, I uh, I left Flint before you redeveloped that, but, you know, my former college campus was just a click mm -hmm. south of Buick City. And uh, actually, my, my father-in-law, who was one of our first graduates here at LCC, oh, he, moved, he moved to Flint in the 50s to work at Buick City. So speaking of that kind of um, mission, you, in addition to this work for uh, uh, the, the trust, you are a, a city council person. Uh, t talk to me about your journey of, of running for city council. Yeah, I had about five or six minutes of free time, so I thought I would. <laughs> 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 no, um, honestly, um, I, um, my philosophy is that if you're going to complain, you need to get involved. I've always had that philosophy. Um, so I was on the parks board initially. Okay. Um, and then I was asked um, to run for city council at large. I'd never ran for public office, um, but I am passionate about local government. Yeah. One of the reasons why I love the job so much is that I get to interact with local government. I, you, see, you see the fruits of your labor firsthand in local government. Right. It, it, you know, once you get to state and federal, it's a lot more murky, but you actually see um, the fruits of your labor, you know, where the dollars are going in local government. And so I ran um, for uh, Lansing City Council at large, and I happened to be lucky to be elected. And so I, I'm so pleased to be in the position. Well, from what I hear, it wasn't luck. I think, <laughs> I think you, you work really hard and you might not know this. We, it's a much smaller city, but you, you and I have that in common. I spent six years as a, a city councilman in Grand Blanc, Michigan, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. outside of Flint. And you're right. Uh, in city government, it's so much more focused on local issues. Yes. You know, uh, in our current environment, it, there's probably nothing less palatable than yes. politics, right? 
but but in city government, it's about things that are closer to home. You know, oh. and, and and I and so thank you for your service, and thank you for, you know, being my city council person. You know, I'm now that I'm a, 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 a Lansing resident again, and so you are. You said you're tired. I think I know why. You're on six <laughs> boards and commissions. How did that happen? You know, I don't know. I think I missed a couple meetings, and then they just kind of put me on. That I is don't what know happens. Why. I don't that know is what happened. happens. Yeah. You know, we are, we are. Um, you know, there are so many, you know, com- committees because the work of the people. There's, a, it's a lot to do, and mm-hmm. so, you know, on city council level, there are a number of committees um, that do everything from issue liquor licenses, look at trash fees, right. um, ways and means, touches on our budget. I happen to chair the um, diversity and inclusion committee. Okay. Um, and so there, are, you know, and all of those, you know, through our resolutions, make policy and recommendations to the mayor. There is a lot to be done to help the mayor run the city. And so we, you know, all of us on council, there's eight of us, um, take that extra duty of, you know, serving on these different boards and commissions. It's, you know, it, it is the, um, it's a uh, supposed to be a part-time position, but I think it's a one and a half time position. Right, <laughs> um, right. So it, you, it keeps you busy, but, you know, you go into a mire or you go somewhere in Lansing and you have a resident come up to you and they're, they're concerned about something or they're expressing gratitude. Um, it's, re- it's really fulfilling to be able to then follow through and help that person. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. What for most people is a shopping trip for you is constituent <laughs> service, right? That's yes. what you're doing. You're, and uh, my kids are like, Mom, I'm like, I'm sorry. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that. Now, I have a question for you about when you were at LCC, um, the kinds of experiences you, you already told me you threw yourself into everything, right? So your experiences here, how have they um, impacted how you uh, work as a member of city council or what, what you do with the trust? What did you learn here that you're able to apply in that great work that you're doing? Well, I learned a couple of things. Um, the one thing is that you are not you are not, you know, your, your universe impacts everybody else. So you're not the center of the world and that your actions are like a ripple effect and they impact everyone else. And so I've learned to, you know, be aware of my surroundings and to, you know, make sure that my actions to the extent that I can, because not not everybody's perfect, but that they're beneficial and not hurtful that, that, you know, actions have consequences. And so I think, you know, being a part of, you know, so many things at LCC and having such great examples um, also made me want to serve, you know, you, you, as, as an, as a student ambassador or, you know, as, you know, a student assistant in Dr. Shire's office, you know, he's the Dean of student services. So people are coming in all the time. Um, It it, it just made me want to serve and, and be of service. So, wow, I hear you say two things. One is uh, you learned a sense of connectedness here, like how we're all connected. And then that last piece about service, that, mm-hmm. that, that it, does, it does feel good to do something that, that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. I know you're, you're, you're making a difference. Um, I want to come back to your committee chairpersonship, uh, the, the diversity and inclusion. Mm-hmm. It's such an important issue in our community right now. We're working on that issue uh, here at uh, at Lansing Community College. Um, tell me about the work of your committee, because in our current moment, I, I don't know that there's more important work to do than than DEI. So tell me about your committee and and uh, and how's it going? It's going very well. Mm-hmm. I think that um, our our current pre- we've had a committee somewhat like this in past. Uh, city council every year we kind of we have a different president and we kind of have committees and we assign folks but in the past we've had um an ad hoc committee in in what that on diversity and those are committees that have to be re um what do you call it reconstituted every year okay right so they're not standing no they're not standing committees thank you for that thank you for that um this year our president um peter spatter for Mm -hmm. um, made diversity and inclusion a standing committee um and and i think it came out of just the things that are happening across the country right and you know that we as a city council have a responsibility to to continue to be better to continue to strive to make sure that what we're doing positively impacts 
everyone. And also to recognize that there are populations, um, you know, minority populations that may not feel that they are being represented um, fairly. Right. And I and I think that, you know, we have to recognize that that is that is that is appropriate. And then we have to then take steps to implement policies and procedures that are equitable. And I didn't say equal, I said equitable. Right. And that is a key distinction, right? And I appreciate you being intentional about those words because equity is different than equality. When I was listening to you talk, it occurred to me that probably most cities about the size of Lansing have problems with equity and disparity and all kinds of things, health outcomes, economic Mm -hmm. outcomes. But there are only 50 capital cities, right? That's correct. And so the spotlight is on us in a way that it isn't. How is it different for a a capital city to work on equity? Well, I think, you know, we are and we should be the leaders. You know, we are, you know, as as the capital city of Lansing, we have that unique position. Mm -hmm. We have the unique position where we're a a stone's throw from the lawmakers that that make laws that affect the entire state. We we are across the street from the governor's office and Governor Whitmer. But more importantly, I think we need to serve as that example um, to the other communities in our great state um, and, and, and be forward thinking in, in, in how we, um, we tackle some of these very weighty issues. Um, what we're doing in our diversity and inclusion committee, the first thing we're, we, we are doing is looking at um, our role in public safety. You know, that is, that is, that is something that is at the forefront today. Correct. And so looking at um, whether or not there needs to be some changes in how we look at public safety. I think that um, every community can do better. And I've, and I've spoken to the police chief and he agrees, we can all do better. Right. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, and, and so our committee is looking at that, working with the police department and working with some of the local um, social groups to, to see what does a reimagined police department look like? What, is it, what does it look like when you reimagine the role of public safety? Do you need to have um, an armed police officer um, go to a welfare check? Right. Or we have a situation here in Lansing where we have folks who avail themselves of our public safety system um, multiple times. And so I think it's our responsibility then to look at that and say, well, do we need to have, you know, do we need to stress our um, fire, police and fire, or can we um, have a social worker and maybe a community police officer that may not be armed attend and go and do a welfare check or the folks who, you know, call police uh, fire departments on a multiple basis. Can we have somebody that's, um, in Austin, they, in Austin, Texas, and I just came back from there, they call them um, community mental health responders. Interesting. And so you could have a social worker and a a paramedic or an EMT visit those people that are um, that call multiple times the fire department multiple times. So you're touching them outside of the nine one one, you know sphere where it's like rush, 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 and you're, right. you're, you're visiting them on a regular basis to make sure they have what they need. Well, listening to you tell that story, and first of all, what a, a cool thing to be benchmarking other communities, right? Yes. I mean, we, it, that goes back to your observation. We're connected, right? Yes. But the other thing is, uh, while you were talking, I thought, you know, if someone is repeatedly uh, being involved with or exposed to or utilizing uh, the public safety infrastructure, there must be some, something systemic going on there okay. that that needs a deeper uh, a deeper look. And I, I would like to share something with you as someone who has come back to the community uh, after a long time away. I just want to pay you a compliment and also our elected uh, board of trustees. Elected officials in Lansing, Michigan, I think, are are kind of on the cutting edge of understanding the issues you're talking about. So, as a constituent, thank you for thinking about that and, and working on it because that's how we make our community better. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, we have a responsibility to do that. 
you know, mentioning our elected officials here and our and the LCC trustees, we are also out in the community a lot. Yes, you are. And and you know, even you know, the, the LCC trustees are are out. I can see them at events mm -hmm. or or at things that are happening representing Lansing Community College, and it 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 makes me proud because I do. I'm 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 bullish on you know LCC, and so right. I, I I love that. But you know. Doing that and reimagining public safety, just think if, you know, someone who is availing themselves, you know, of the fire department or the police department, and like you said, there has to be something else going on. Right. Why wouldn't we reach out to them, you know, you know, in a situation where it's not so charged or you don't have to have someone that's armed and, and ask them what do they need, whether it's housing or mental health issues or food. We have those resources in the city of Lansing. And so coordinating those and having a coordinated plan on reaching those people, again, outside the 911 structure, I think makes our community better. I couldn't agree more. Let's get to those root causes, right? Well, Congressperson Spitzley, it's wonderful to talk to you. Congress, not yet Congress. Councilwoman Oh, Spitzley. thank you so much. Can I do that over? I, I well, actually, actually, let's leave it in there. Con I, I gave you a promotion to I know. That's a little bit more work. I'd be even more tired than I am now. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and you need some rest. So, <laughs> and so, Councilwoman Spitzley, thank you so much for spending some time with me on the podcast. It's just been wonderful to talk with you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. This episode of LCC Alumni Stories was recorded and engineered by Steve Robinson in the Michigan Room at LCC's downtown campus and produced virtually by Brock Elsasor from LCC's Digital Media, Audio, and Cinema program. The soundtrack is licensed to the college through DeWolf Music. Thanks for listening. Tune in to future episodes and learn more about what our alumni have been up to. If you're an LCC alum and want to share your story, send me an email at steve underscore robinson at lcc.edu. Until next time, keep learning. This has been LCC DMAC, Lansing Community College Digital Media, Audio, and Cinema.